He gave himself up for me. He must really love me. Then you must say, well, what about it when uh, life seems so unfair? Uh, if he loves me so much, what about those times when I just have this feeling that life is just unfair? Well, it's at those times that the Bible says you need to live by faith. We've been studying the book of Habakkuk. It's a little tiny uh, book in the Bible, only three chapters long. And it's uh, unlike all the other prophets, all the others they're preaching and heralding. And this one, he's talking, there's a dialogue going on between him and God. And he is just downright complaining. If you've been with us, you know he's complaining. He's complaining about society. He's complaining about the politics of the day. Anybody here have a few gripes about politics today? Huh? <laughs> All right. Nothing has changed, okay? He's complaining about the politics, the injustices, the wrong that's going on, and God seems like he's doing nothing. So he complains to God. And we said, it's okay to complain to God. Not to your neighbor, not to your spouse, not to a friend, but to God. You go to God with your complaint. He did. He went to the God, God with his complaint, and God gave him an answer. But, you know, sometimes God gives an answer and we just don't kind of like the answer he gives. Oh, well, it's like last week. Somebody was praying that the weather would change and it did. We got snow and we got ice. And you said, I was expecting a different kind of change. Well, he was praying and saying, God, you got to do something about all this violence. He said, I am. God said, I am. I'm raising up the Babylonians, that terrible, terrible, violent, nation, and they're going to come and discipline you. And he said, well, whoa, time out here, God. That's not the answer I wanted to my prayer. And he's saying, wait a minute, they are worse than we are. How in the world can you use them to judge us? How can you do that? And God answers in the second chapter. We'll see a little bit more of that next week because uh, we're going to pause for a moment on this great verse of the Bible. But he's going to show us that, hey, listen, as soon as I'm done dealing, using them to deal with your problems, I'm going to raise up the Medio persian Empire to deal with them. Oh, and then after that, because they're not very good either, I'm going to raise up the Grecian Empire to deal with them. Oh, and hey, guess what? Because the Greeks aren't all that hot, I'm going to raise up the Romans to deal with them, and God is constantly in control in our world. He's in control. And this is the message he's given, and, and he says, you've got to live by faith. God told Habakkuk, we're at just one verse today, one verse, but the righteous will live by his faith. When times are tough, when the fire's put to it, that's when the genuine, real Christians shine because the flame burns away all the dross and the gold is refined. All those professing Christians who really aren't Christians they seem to leave, and it's only the genuine Christians that remain. And what he says is, when life seems unfair, the righteous, but the righteous will live by his faith. This is the first time that is mentioned, this phrase is mentioned in the Bible, but it occurs three more times. The Apostle Paul borrows this phrase in the book of Galatians. In fact, the book of Romans, the whole book of Romans is built on this one little phrase. The book of Hebrews, the author of the book of Hebrews, he also records this short little phrase. From these four passages, where it brings up this little phrase, the just shall live by faith or the righteous will live by faith, I want to ask four questions. So today I'm going to ask you four questions. See, like the Apostle Paul uses it to apply it to the people in his day, I want to use the same verse to apply to the people in my day. And so I'm going to ask you four questions. The first question is, is your faith exceptional? You see what he says is, but. <clears throat> He's been complaining about how bad and terrible it is. But, in contrast to all of that, this evil empire, this, this people that are coming to destroy them, he says, but the righteous will live by faith. You see, everybody believes something. Everybody believes something. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I run into a person, he says, oh, I mean, I run into people, they say, I, I don't believe in Jesus. I said, what do you believe in? He said, oh, I'm an atheist. So what they're saying is, I believe there is no God. See, they believe something. They, they have a belief. 
I run to another guy, and he says, uh, I'm an agnostic. And I says, oh, so he believes that you can't know. He believes something. He believes you can't know. Everybody believes something. You believe something. In fact, some people, and most people, I would say most people believe in themselves. I don't need God because I'm okay on my own. What do I need God for, right? That was the Babylonians. They don't need God. They worship their war machine. They worship the, you know, it says that they worship the nets, and the net was their war machine. They, they worshiped themselves. They had their own thing that they were worshiping. I don't need God. Some worship their allies. He was uh, conquering nation after nation, absorbing those people into his people and their armies into his armies, and they were going. And some people say, listen, I don't need God. I don't need church. I, I got my own friends. That's enough. I believe in my friends. My friends will get me through everything I need. You see? See what I'm saying? Everybody believes something. Some people believe in war. The Babylonians did. Uh, before them, the Assyrians, they didn't even have farmers, man. They just said, you, go you want to eat? You go conquer somebody else's farm, okay? You just, they believe in war. You've met those kind of people, right? They, they thrive on conflict. They're constantly stirring the pot. You probably think in your family, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> you know that relative, you know, you know what I'm talking about. They believe that conflict is supposed to be the norm, but they believe something. Some people believe it's all about winning. It's all about winning, success. Life is about success, and they believe in success. I don't need God, I'll make it on my own. I got it, I'll be on my own. Some people believe in power. That's the most dangerous. Power struggles, trying to control. Some of you know someone who's a control freak, and maybe somebody here is a control freak. I don't know. Got to be in control. They believe in control. Some people believe in stuff. This is most of middle America, middle income America. I've got to accumulate enough stuff. And if I have enough stuff, then that proves that I'm successful. And I've really, I've got the life. I am really living. This is the life. I have arrived. You see? I don't need God. I got everything I need. Right? Still others, it's cash, money. You see, money can buy you just about anything. Anytime somebody talks about winning the lotto, our minds, they just go, about everything that we would do. We think about who we would help, the boats and the, heart, the cars and the houses, all the things that we would buy, because money can get me anything. And some people say, I don't need God, I need money. Right? They believe in money. Money's the answer to everything in life. Some people believe it's family, kin, relatives. It's, you know, family's all I need. I don't need God, I got my family. What do I need, what do I need God for? I got, I've got my family. I'm not saying all these things are unimportant. I'm saying they're important. They're just, that's not where you place your faith. They're all going to let you down. Every one of these is going to let you down. Everyone's going to let you down. The last one is the law. The law. And I'm not talking about America's law. I'm talking about God's law. God's law. The Ten Commandments. The ten are just kind of an introduction to all the law. A guy by the name of Maimonides back in the Middle Ages, he counted up all the commands or prohibitions in the Old Testament or the Torah, the first five books. There's 613. 613. If that wasn't enough, the Jews then made laws upon top of the laws, and they had all these laws that you had to keep. People today are still trying to keep the law to be as their way of salvation and deliverance. In fact, when we get to the book of Galatians, look, at every one of these guys got law on it. <laughs> They're do-gooders. They're trying to keep the law in order to impress God so that they can be accepted by God. I ask people when I share my faith. This is probably one of the number one questions I ask. I says, suppose you died and you stood before God and you said to God, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say to God? And the person says, well, I'm a good person. But the number one answer is, I keep the Ten Commandments the best I can. I do the best I can. They're law keepers. They're trying, they're trying to do something to make them good enough that God would accept them. How sad. Paul's writing the, God, he's writing the book of Galatians. 
to tell them that you're saved by faith alone and not by doing good works, no matter what those works may be. Even if it's the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments can't save you. They only prove that you're guilty and you need to be saved. That's exactly what the Ten Commandments were for. He says here, clearly no one is justified. The word justified is the same word as righteous. English borrows from various languages, and so we have two words that mean the exact same thing. To be justified and to be righteous are the same. Clearly, no one is made righteous before God by the law. So no matter what you're doing, you need to be the exception to all of that, is what he's saying. Because, here's the reason, the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. That's the exception. What I want to say today is, your faith, your faith can be exceptional. You don't have to have faith like everyone else. You don't have to have a mediocre faith. You don't, you don't have to have just, just a, a Sunday faith. It, it can be a part of your life, and you can embrace this. You can have the exceptional life, and that's what God wants for you. He wants your, your faith to be exceptional. My second question is this. Is your faith that righteous faith that he's talking about? But the righteous will live by faith. Now, when I go to the the book of the Romans, written by the Apostle Paul, there's a verse before that says, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's the power of God. Why? Verse 17. For in the gospel, the good news message that we proclaim, in the message that Jesus Christ came into the world, the sinless Son of God, as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, he went to the cross, sin was put on him, our sin, he died for it, so he has eternal life to give to all who receive it. That's the good news, that if I believe in Jesus, I don't work in order to have acceptance by God. Jesus did all the work for me, I just have to accept that work that he has done. The gospel, he says, for in this gospel message is the righteousness from God that it is revealed. Listen, it's a righteousness that is by faith from A to Z, from the beginning to the end, from start to finish, first to last, no matter how you say it. I was eight years old and I accepted Jesus as my Savior. At that moment, I was declared righteous by God, justified, righteous. Since then, I've been walking in faith, you see, because I want to finish well. I started at A, I want to be at Z. And the way I do that is not by keeping a bunch of rules, not by trying to be a good person. I live by faith. And when I believe in the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, as it says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. When you have that kind of faith where you love him, you will do what is right, not because you have to, but because you want to. Isn't that beautiful? The righteous faith. He says, goes on, he says, just, and now he's quoting Habakkuk. Just as it's written, the righteous will live by faith. Go a few pages into the book of Romans, you find this verse. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. Every time I come across that word credit, I think of a credit card. (laughs) Hey, you want righteousness, so you go down to the righteousness store, right? And you go into the righteousness store, and you're bringing in all your good works, right? You got all your good works, you got them in a big bag, okay? And when you open it up, and you present it for the righteousness, Isaiah 64 Six says this, all your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And you put these filthy rags out there. And you say, I'd like to get righteousness. And he says, uh, unacceptable. Oh, I said, well, what do you take? Oh, we take the righteousness of Jesus. You whip out the Jesus card. Oh, this is my faith in Jesus. You, it's a chip card, see? And you stick it in the machine. <laughs> you stick it in the machine. And, and all of a sudden, it reads across there, yes. You've just been imputed, charged to your account, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You see, you can't get it any other way. It takes faith. It was credited to him. Listen, now, 
When a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. When you work, I bring in my filthy rags and I say, okay, this is, give me what I, I deserve with this. And God says, it just needs to be torched. <laughs> That's all, you get what you deserve. But he says, however, to the man who does not work, but he trusts, he believes, he places his faith in God who makes a man righteous, even the wicked man righteous, that faith is credited as righteousness. It's our faith. And so I ask, is your faith righteous? Your faith can't be righteous. Take that misdirected faith in yourself, in your job, in your work, in your family, and whatever it is, you take that faith and you redirect it to the Lord Jesus Christ. You redirect it to Jesus Christ. My third question is, is your faith alive? But the righteous will live by his faith. Will live. For this, I go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 38, where the author of the book of Hebrews, he quotes it right at the very beginning of this verse. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. So here's a person who says, you know, they make a profession of faith, and it's kind of like where the seed has fallen on the soil. It springs up quickly, and then when the, the winds and the heat come out, it scorches it and drives it away because it doesn't have deep root. It was among the, the stones. And, and so he, he starts out, but, but things get a little difficult, and he, he shrinks back. He goes on and says, but we are not of those who go back. We who started at A, we're going to Z. He that started at the beginning is going to complete his faith. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. The very next verse is chapter 11, verse 1, and he defines the faith he's talking about. Now, the faith that, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Remember the, the, the week after Jesus had raised from the dead. He appeared, the, the very first night when he raised from the dead, he appeared in the room to the disciples and Thomas wasn't there. And the disciples said, oh, when Thomas arrived, Jesus was here, we saw him. And he said, oh, no, no, I don't, you guys are trying to pull one over on me. Unless I put my hand in the wound of his side, the nail prints of his hand, I won't believe. The next week, that Sunday night, having service once again, Jesus appears, and he turns to Thomas and says, right here, put your hand in there. Put it right there. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says this, blessed are you because you believe, because you have seen, but blessed are those who have never seen, and they believe, just like you who have seen. Isn't that amazing? I've never seen Jesus. I believe in him. I believe in him with all my heart. I believe. That's faith. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That is what the ancients were commended for. Watch this. He says, by faith, Abel offered. Abel worshiped God. But it was by faith. Abel offered, but Cain, his brother, his offering was not acceptable because he did not do it in faith. A lot of people go to church and go through the motions. They look like, they act like, they even smell like Christians. But if they don't have faith in their heart, you are not truly worshiping Jesus Christ with a faith in your heart. Then your is not accepted just as Cain's wasn't and Abel's was. By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. By faith, Enoch, he goes on and tells a story about Enoch. And the Old Testament says, Enoch walked with God. You know, that's progress. That's every day. And he lived 365 years. Then it says, Enoch was taken so that he was not, all of a sudden he's missing. Hey, where's, where's Enoch? Hey, I don't know where Enoch is. Where's Enoch? He was taken because God took him kind of like the rapture that's spoken of in, in the book of Thessalonians. When Jesus returns, he's going to take all the Christians out of the world, and all of a sudden they're going to say, hey, there's a lot of people missing here. Enoch was taken, it says, because he pleased God. And the very next verse says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. You see, he was walking his life, 365 
years. He was walking by faith with God. One day God said to him, hey, Enoch, we've been walking together 365 years, you know. Uh, instead of going home, why don't you just come home with me? Boom. He was gone to heaven, gone to heaven. It goes on and it says, by faith, Noah built an ark. Noah built the ark. Now, Noah also walked with God. Another expression about Noah, Noah also walked with God. Noah was walking with God every day. You know how long it took to build that ark? I think it took a few weeks, a few months. Most theologians think it took 120 years. It was just him and his family putting this thing together. That is really staying at the task for God. That is really serving God. You know what? He was also preaching at that time. Good thing he wasn't into numbers because he preaches for 120 years and he's got seven converts. His family. That's it. That's it. You see, it's, we're not in the numbers games here, folks. We are in the faith business. Real faith, living every day, serving every day, no matter what the results are. I am not doing this so that I get a pat on the back from you at the church. I want to hear from him, well done, good and faithful servant. See, it's a whole different motivation. I want him to be pleased. I want him to be pleased. Is your faith alive? Abraham preoccupies most of Hebrews chapter 11. Abraham, and you know the story, he is told by God, he's put to test. You ever been tested on your faith? Your faith ever been tested? Here's the test. Hey, take your only begotten son, Isaac, and take him up to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. He takes him up there, and you know the story. He's about to sacrifice him, and the angel of the Lord interrupted and stopped him from doing that. And instead, there was a, a ram caught in the thickets. It's in Hebrews chapter 11 where it says, Abraham was willing to kill him because he believed the promise of God that he would have children through that son, and God would have to raise him from the dead. That's powerful faith, folks. That's a living faith. When you're against the worst obstacle and trial and difficulty in your life and said, I'm going to trust God no matter what. That's living faith. This is, oh, 20 years ago, you know, at camp, I sang a song and we prayed. This is, I'm living this every day, every day type of faith. How about Moses? By faith, it says Moses chose to be mistreated with the people of Israel rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You see, he was in Pharaoh's courts. He was an adopted son of Pharaoh. He might have had access to being on the throne someday if the other son had died or something like that. He chucked it all. All the world had to offer to go and serve the people of God who were going to be mistreated. That's living by faith. That's what our missionaries have done to goods. They said, I'm leaving America behind, all the comfort, all, the, all of that. I'm going to go learn a whole new language so I can minister to a people who want to hear. Who want to hear. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea. I love this passage. Imagine you had been there. Moses parts the sea and said, come on, everybody through it. And you say, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> You go first. You know, you kind of, well, the, the Egyptians are coming. Well, maybe I better go first. And you're going down through, and, and here they are, man. And the, and the wind's blowing, and the, the walls of the water are teetering back and forth. And you're getting a little spray on yourself, but you know you're on dry ground. Somehow God made, made it dry. And, and you're passing through. You are step by step trusting, you're having faith that I'm going to get to the other side. That's living by faith. It's living by faith. They pass through. Oh, and then it goes on and it says that the, the uh, Egyptians trying to do, psh, the waters came back and destroyed them. And the point there is you can never, ever please God on somebody else's faith. You can't get to heaven on somebody else's faith. Just because your husband or your wife or your mother or your father, every now and then somebody says, well, you know, my, 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 my dad was a, a pastor. Okay, good for him. I'm glad he was. What's your spiritual condition? Because <laughs> you're not getting anywhere in somebody else's faith. Here we got the, the next story. And I'm not even including all of these. I'm kind of cherry picking through Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell 
For seven days, they marched around the city. Remember last fall when we went through all of this? They marched around the city. First time they go around the city, nothing's happening. Second day, nothing's happening. They go and they go. Fight. And on the seventh day, they blow the trumpet. The walls come crashing down. We are such an impatient people. I got to have it. I got to have the answer now. And God says, no, I want you to do this seven times before it's going to happen. I want you to go through it for seven years before it's going to happen. By faith, they lived every day, every day by faith, of what God would do. He says, and what more shall I say? There was Daniel, and the lion's mouths were shut. What's he going to say? There was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The, the fire was quenched. He says, and then, oh, he said, then. Those were heroes, but I'm going to tell you about the real heroes of the faith. Can I? Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. Oh. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They lived their faith and would not recant. They died for their faith. That's a real living faith. A real living faith. He goes on and says, the world was not worthy of them. Oh. Wouldn't that be great? God said, you know, I want to bring you home. The Lord says, I want to bring you home because the world is not worthy of you. Wow, that's powerful stuff. These were all commended for their faith. This is, all, this is a faith story. They, they're living out their faith. They're living out their faith. What I'm trying to say is your faith can be alive too. These people were no superhuman beings. They were common, ordinary people, just like you and me. But they believed God. They believed God. The final one. Is your faith personal? Personal. This is a, but the righteous will live by his faith. Not by the faith, like I got a body of doctrines, the Nicene Creed, or, you know, one of those things. Not, not the body of faith. Now, you got to subscribe through these things. Just check them off. Oh, yeah, 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 I, I agree with those. Therefore, let's not talk about that. By his faith, your faith, is your faith personal? It was for Habakkuk. Here's what he says at the end of the book. I'm trying to, kind of jumping to the end. I hope I don't spoil the last message in this series. <laughs> Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, and though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, oh man, I, we've got a famine. I mean, it, it's terrible. There are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stock. Listen, nothing is going right in my life. God, you told me you're going to send the, the, the armies are going to destroy us and, and I'm not going to have anything. He says, even in that, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God, of my, God and my Savior. I will rejoice. That takes incredible living faith. And it has to be personal. This is what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to remind you, trying to remind you that your faith can be exceptional. You can be the exceptional person of faith. There's nothing hindering you from doing that. Your faith is what will make you righteous. Nothing else can do this. You will become more righteous the more you exercise your faith. Your faith needs to be alive. You've got to live it. Don't just talk it. It's got to be your life. You live it. You do it. Your faith must be personal. It must be your faith. Your faith. Your faith alone. And the question is, how? How do I do all this? How? How? It's very simple. You develop a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I can't do that for you. You can't do that for me. You have to develop your own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. A few things you can do to do that. First of all, you accept him as your Savior and Lord. You get into the Word because in the Word, he speaks to us. 
you begin to pray because in prayer, you speak to him. You hang out with God's people because we're family, brothers and sisters in Christ. And you will begin to see your faith grow. You join a Bible study group. You get involved. You find a Christian service. You do what God wants you to do. You live by faith. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it is our prayer today that everyone here will know Jesus as Savior by simply praying and saying at some point in their life, and hopefully if not before today, that they'll do it today. And they'll just say, Lord, I need you as my Savior and Lord. Save me, deliver me. I believe in you. I receive your righteousness. I'll live by faith because I want my faith to be personal relationship with you. Lord, we know anyone who would pray that sincerely from their heart, that you would save them. For you said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the heart of the Bible. You saving us from what we messed up. You're our Savior, you're our God, and that's why we worship you. May these words that we've spoken today resonate with us through the week that we would live by faith alone. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.